thanks everybody. Um, this is going to be very kind of dog and pony show, I think, compared to most of what we've seen that's been uh, a little more technical. But <clears throat> the main idea is just to touch base on what a font might do for you in your, your construct. What kind of new opportunities for creativity and design it might open up if you don't have one. But I wanted to start out by asking, how many people have your own construct? Raise your hand, please. Well, that's about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly large. How many of you have a font or more? Raise two hands if you have more. <laughs> okay, so that's about <laughs> um, How many of you uh, design them on like iFont Maker or okay, so brand new? And everybody else is working in, in font development software, I assume. So. Who's, who's, nev who's, who's never used any kind of font development software? Oh, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and some of the things David mentioned earlier that, you know, kind of font building and whatnot has inherited from the Western tradition of the thing. Um, but I'll start out by just asking this maybe rhetorical question, why go to the trouble? Because it can be a lot of trouble, I don't know. He said it took about 200,000 hours, right? <laughs> but I think one of, the, one of the reasons for me is that even looking at, at this language up here, we have uh, in Japanese, if you can read Japanese, you know that says, but if you can't, you probably still recognize it as a real writing system. It reads to you as something that is probably used in the real world. And a lot of that has to do with the design, the regularity, and other things that go on. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Harris to read the next line. Um, hi, Lesha. Which is in Orsa. And it means? And that means, um, well, why go to the trouble, but basically, uh, why labor? Why labor, right. So different, I mean, it's, it's expressed differently. In Japanese, it's um, you know, why persevere so to that extent? You know, everybody says it a different way. But when it's in a font, it, it reads in a special kind of way for, for most people. What does the Ilani say? Jim Hopkins, unfortunately, could not be here. The Ilani says, um, uh, which I believe means why so much trouble yourself. Mm -hmm. in that moment. And then finally, uh, language that Josh and I are using in his film. He mentioned this last night at dinner. My husband is making, he decided he was going to make a feature film, so we're doing it. Um, and he got a con line for free. <laughs> David, I want you to send him an invoice so he can see what, what, what he's getting for free. Um, so that's Bono uh, Umru Senna, which, uh, excuse me, Senna, which is. Uh, why, uh, why uh, in, 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 do it inconveniencing yourself kind of thing too. So anyway, they're all fonts. This is not artwork. It's real fonts that are showing up in Kina on the map. And every, almost everything that's coming up here is that. Um, here's a very, here's Golik Vulcan and Gen. So I think the main reason to do a font is for your language. Uh, you do it for aesthetic reasons, maybe, or you can do it for everyday communication. So here's regular email, back and forth between me and Jim. Again, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Ilani, and I'm using one of the fonts I designed for him at the bottom, and he's responding in his own, which is his favorite at the top, because he finds that most legible. So, um, you know, not in Unico, no magic going on. It's just that we both have the same fonts on our computers, and with HTML-based email, uh, you can use your conscript for everyday communication if you have it as a font. Um, and the reason that I'm kind of here today, honestly, is because Jim reached out to me because he found this Vulcan stuff that he was interested in that I was doing online, and <clears throat> introduced me to Tony. And we started talking about fonts and whether people had fonts and this and that and the other. So we kind of gifted to each other, first becoming friends, but then we went in on the software. And uh, we all paid, and I ended up buying Fontographer, which is a software title that hasn't been mentioned yet. Not as sophisticated as what they would use, but a little more sophisticated than some of the other options. And uh, we made, I made fonts for them, and they collaborated with me. 
So through that gift of each other, Jim now has actually more than this, uh, eight typefaces. Uh, this is all Ilan, his Kong world, written in Ilani. And uh, there are two different major styles of writing in Ilani, uh, change fair and mini fit. And the second one is based on his handwriting. So Jim can read all of this absolutely the same way. It's all fluent to him in the same way that you can read basically any Roman font that you come across. Um, I think it's also a little bit about your soul when you have a, a conscript. You know, when you have a font to go with it, it kind of solidifies things a little bit more if you're interested, again, in kind of formal presentation or design. And today we're going to look at uh, using Tony's handwriting, which he has been taking down in his book very thoroughly all day long notes. Uh, we're going to look at how uh, I turned, uh, actually I haven't finished the font, but part of his handwriting into an actual font. And the main reason for me as somebody who's kind of interested in using this in design is for peace of mind or serenity. So for example, in, in this graphic, the piece in the middle, uh, which is a, a single uh, Golic Vulcan letter, the letter Z, pronounced Zoom, is a one-off thing. It's just a piece of artwork that I did in Adobe Illustrator. But to accomplish this circular text going around the outside, it would be really, really a lot of trouble and a pain in the you-know-what, whatever, however you say that in your language. Um, <laughs> To make this happen graphically, if I didn't have a font, then I couldn't just put text on the path the way that you would do if you were running off the path. So again, uh, we're going to be talking very much about things that you might create using a computer today as opposed to doing things by hand. And again, kind of uh, with Josh's idea, my husband's idea to do this movie, uh, I've had the opportunity to, for him, for a real project, although it's just the two of us. Uh, think about what it would be like to have a world in which a conscript is the main form of writing and it's used as a visual cue, a design cue in the film. So uh, in the movie that we're making, there's no Roman script whatsoever. And on the world in which it takes place, all the language that you see visually is all in this language that I've come up with for the film which uh, is Sinyanda. And Sinyanda actually just means written language because it's not important that this language be spoken in this film. All the dialogue with the exception of just a few words and place names and you know, I think the name of the disease and a couple of other things are in the language. But everything else is going to be in English. But we're using this design as an ideal for a part of the suspension of disbelief. So uh, I think I have a clip coming up and I think it's next. Um, for Sen. That's the title of the film. It's actually the personal name of the main character, the protagonist. And here's Sen's name written in Sinyanda. And here is a conscript-centric look at uh, his world. Oh.
So I'm going to show you some of the props and other things that we've come up with that we're going to be using for set decoration and other stuff here and there. And again, it would be very difficult to make these things if I didn't, if I hadn't made fonts or at least created font-ready artwork in the computer. Um, everything is in a single language, but you see their their typographic and stylistic variations in the orthography. So that's one of the cues that we're used to in our everyday life. That you know, there's brushy-looking stuff and there's very formal-looking stuff and stuff with serifs or feet and stuff that's straight and plain like Helvetica. So uh, we have a lot of those variations too. And the time frame uh, kind of context, artistic, aesthetic context for this is kind of a 1930s, 40s vibe. Uh, a great disrepair. Um, and one of the things that I've tried to do is just take wherever they would be writing in English or some other language and just replace that with Sinyanda. So, you know, if there was a tag on a piece of clothing, for example, we might put a tag and some young on it just to uh, create a continuity. Uh, the people, the main characters are factory workers, they wear badges. So again, um, these things are laser cut out of paper and plastic and then painted and distressed. But if I didn't have fonts, if I didn't have, you know, camera, ready artwork, so to speak, you know, actual outlines and actual uh, things generated in the computer, it would be very difficult to create these kinds of things. Uh, there's a scene in which uh, a transaction occurs in the movie, I won't tell you all about it, but, um, but again, everything, every piece of paper, every signature, everything that has to do with um, where we might normally have Roman alphabet or uh, regular English in the film, you will see, if not hear, uh, this language represented visually. Uh, down to signatures and things like that. Wow. So here's the currency, for example. And again, the main point of today is to talk about how these fonts get made. So I'm going to do that in a very simple way, and um, we'll then take questions. So this is kind of my workflow. And I do most of my artwork in Adobe Illustrator. I've been using that application for about 25 years, believe it or not, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that. Um, and there's first a hand design sketch process that everybody I'm sure knows about when you're coming up with your glyphs and your, your idea. There's a formal drawing process, and then there's normalization and other things that you do in order to make everything work and fit together. So I'm going to go through those kind of step by step. And to reiterate what David said, you know, there's a tremendous amount of time involved in actually getting everything to fit together. The, the creative side of it is not the most time consuming part of it. So that's why I started the presentation with, you know, why bother, why go to the trouble? Because it is a lot of trouble in most cases to do it if you use this process. Um, but you start by designing or sketching. And again, I'm not going to talk about design aesthetics or, or how you create an inter interesting system, whether that's an Avogadro or an alphabet or you know something else, a logographic system. Uh, I think there's another session for that tomorrow, which I'm going to hate to miss because I won't be here. But um, I think you'll enjoy that side of the thinking about the design process. Then. So this is Tony's handwriting, and he just did scans on and emailed these to me. And I asked him to do three, do each letter three times, so I could see if there was some kind of variation or some kind of consistency. And typically, I picked one, and I'm like, this one is going to be my model. And then uh, the next step was to draw over that or trace over that letter that I picked out of his set. Um, using tools in Adobe Illustrator. And again, you're, the goal is to get crisp lines and things that you can work with uh, actually as an outline for the font. Because all fonts are basically outlines with black, filled with black or some other color, and then occasionally holes chopped in that um, to make the, the what looks like the, the opening in the middle of it. It's just another path. And there, there are rules within font making about how to have one read as black and the other read as a hole. So again, I just traced over what Tony sent me and tried to be as faithful as possible. But at the same time, 
it's really important to kind of normalize everything if you want it to look like a typeface, the kind of thing that would be used on a computer. So if there's an eccentricity with a hook that usually occurs at the end of a stroke or something like that, you would want to be consistent with those things to the extent that, that when you're done, they all look like they belong together. Um, here, again, is basically the same letter form, but if you're going to put a thick thinness on one of them, you've got to do it on all of them. If you're going to make one of them look like it was written with charcoal, then make all of them look like they were written with charcoal. And ultimately, no matter how you draw these things, uh, what you end up with are outlines. The important thing to the way fonts work on computers is that the outlines are correct. And you have to be a little careful. This one, for example, with this very rough kind of brush looking thing, as originally drawn and converted, is a little bit too rough to actually become the outline for a font. If you have these overlapping dots and really sharp angles and other things like that, you can actually go to the trouble to build a font and then find that it doesn't actually work. Um, because the, the, even though it may look like it's going to work, your font software may be able to deal with it. The Apple, uh, actual word processors and other things can. It might throw an error or a, a specific operating system might reject it if you're not careful about having clean outlines. The other thing that you have to do that takes a lot of time and care is, is mapping everything to the way you're actually going to type it in. So with a complex script like Korean or Japanese, there's actually an input method, a special program that's required that interprets keystrokes in order to figure out how you're going to get all those complex characters in. In this example, we have the Ilani A and the Ilani B um, up here, but we have to figure out with any font how you're going to map them to keystrokes or how you're actually going to type it in. So in most uh, font software, in this case we're, I'm talking about Fontographer, there's a, a list of standards that you might start with. Standard Roman, a Roman that's better for Eastern European, or a more traditional uh, way uh, to do the encoding for Arabic, for example. So you can pick one of these defaults, and you end up, you see in the background this big blank thing that's just waiting for you to fill in all the blanks with the different sound values and the way that you key to the font. Um, this is actually an example of Salakefa, which is the first font I did for Tony, and he's going to pronounce that vowel over us. It's called app, like app. app. And cat, okay. So here is the original font that I had done for him a couple years ago. And the thing that you have to be careful about is that when you decide a map for your language, you're kind of deciding it for everything. You know, if you have eight or nine different typefaces, you're not going to type them all differently. They all have to be typed the same way. So planning for this mapping or how this is going to work is really important. So when creating a handwritten version, it's got a map to the same thing. And in his orthography, this maps to a gra, to a gra. Um, so again, you have to be consistent. It, it's not just about making pretty letter forms. You have to do a lot of planning for the logic of the way it's going to work as a tool. Um, here is a, a more complex situation where uh, this letter is typically romanized with four different letters. So that is pronounced. That is sh-ta, and it is written S-H-T-H. Yeah, so in the Roman orthography, four. You get four letters to deal with. So the question then becomes, how are you going to deal with that? And in the case of Tony's font, they're not enough glyphs. It's not like an Avogito with all of the complex forms that David showed us in Castathon. So he, uh, instead of doing what David did, which is, is come up with letter names, I mean, a specific name for each glyph, um, we simply have mapped different things to different lowercase or capital letters or whatnot. And when Tony types, he remembers that, oh, in order to get a uh, the, you have to type a uh, capital W, whereas if you want a regular Y, I assume, you just type a lowercase W. So you have basically two choices. Um, this old style of doing it is a little bit safer still on typical computer technology. If you use David's method, then you have to have a little bit more complex software sometimes to interpret it. So, um, for example, um, here's David's feature file. Uh, in the background, let me excuse me. 
So in David's syllabary, you see all of these different names for the, for the letters coming up and combinations. And he even has special symbols in there for like, um, what, male and female and, uh, and several other things. Uh, he, can, he can tell us what some of the examples are. Slash and what is Rizimiro, for example? Uh, the, 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 well, I don't have a mic, but uh, the cast have uh, five, six or seven different casts. Mm -hmm. And the, each cast has a symbol. So it's a symbol, a specialized symbol for one of the casts within the language. But in order to have a glyph for that, uh, you, you would have to have either a gigantic keyboard, right, that you could have a special thing on it, which is not practical. Everybody has basically standard keyboards. So you have to name each glyph, and then as you type them out, the, the font has to do a lookup and know that, oh, I'm typing you know, this consonant cluster plus this vowel, or I'm typing this specific symbol, which is one of the casts from cast event. So again, there are different ways to do it. Um, in the case of Tony's font, we opted for uh, not doing that. And I honestly don't have all the technical skills to do it yet. It's something that I need to learn. I know I need to learn it, but I haven't learned it yet. So if you need to ask about that, there's the gentleman sitting there with the microphone. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on. So again, uh, no matter how you create your artwork, uh, it needs to become a glyph in the software that you're using. And again, this is a matter of semantics. I mean, it's the same thing. It's an outline done in a drawing program, or it's an outline done in the font software. And you'll notice here, actually, even in the font software on the left, there's a palette. In most font development software, there's a full palette of tools that you can use there. I'm just more used to using Adobe Illustrator, and I have more control. I, I, I know those tools better. So I bring things over from Illustrator instead of drawing them directly in the font software. So once you have all of your individual uh, letters or syllables or whatever it is that you've designed uh, brought over, or you're drawing them one by one in the software, uh, you realize that they all live in a cage, basically. And I call it a cage, a <coughs> box. And that box is right here, and it consists of a baseline. Everybody understands what a baseline is, right? Um, that's where this kind of backward H looking off ah is sitting. And um, there are lots of other things that you have to learn, too. So baseline, we just typically know, but we typically don't know what a left side bearing is or a glyph for <coughs> Or um, the descender, you may know what a descender is on the lowercase g, for example, but it's technically this line uh, below which nothing should descend uh, within a font. And there's also the cast height. So anything that goes up too much above that is likely to not end up showing up in your word processor properly. So you have to stay within the lines, basically. And these lines are going to have relationship to the characters that come before them and after them. Um, the other thing that is typical to most uh, products is that you can take almost anything and use it as a template or an outline. So in this case, I've taken a different uh, letter that had you know, the right kind of balance for me of thick and thin and kind of curvature to use it as a model. So this has been placed on the guides layer, and then all the other glyphs that I bring in sit on top of that. So I can kind of use it as a guide. So I know that ah in relationship to a in relationship to a in relationship to a in relationship to everything else is basically looking like the same thickness and the same height and fitting in the box in this case more or less the same way. So let's pretend that you've done all 100 or 150 of your glyphs and you figured out how they all map. And now you want to actually start doing words. So there's a process called kerning. Does everybody know what kerning is basically in software? You have, you have an idea. Kerning is the left-right relationship of all the letters to each other. Again, if you have vertical type, the concept of kerning is a little bit different, but that would be then the vertical relationship between all of the, the letters. And in this case, um, I just typed a nonsense word, which Tony could pronounce for us, even though it's probably, it, this, is a, this doesn't mean like your mother is ugly or something, does it? No, that is truly nonsense. Yeah, so in reads, English we would use nonsense too. Yeah, it, it reads on um, zaquage. Yeah, and zaquage is just um, a nonsense word, but I need to see how 
Kaja and A and, and Kwa and A and Ja relate to each other. So again, in the upper left, it's kind of hard to see. That's typed in. And to get the Ja glyph, I have to type a capital Z. And Tony has lots of vowels. And they don't use diacritics, so they're all different symbols. But you can't, in the case of his font, you can't just kern A once with all the other consonants because they're different A's. There's an A and there's an A and there are, what are your other A's? Uh, there's, there's A and A and A and A and A and, oh, and a schwa like A. Uh, so, and all of those typically would map to the letter A with the diacritic and the Roman alphabet, but they're all a separate glyph in his system. So you see that depending on the, the, the design ideas that you, you have and the decisions that you make in the design process could impact, could actually in the font making process impact the amount of work that you have. Because if he just used one A uh, and then used diacritics, then you would have less, probably less work to do in this curving department. But kerning is one of the things that takes a tremendous amount of time. Unless you have something that's truly monospace, like the courier font in English, um, you're, you're going to spend probably some time kerning things. And you can do it in a manual process. Here you would dra grab this K for kerning and literally just drag it left and right. And that would change the kerning pair relationship, change the number of values to either negatives or positives, depending on whether you're pushing the right letter closer to the left letter or further away from it. Mm -hmm. So here's something that um, has not really been completely kerned, or it might have been auto kerned. So actually a lot of the programs will auto kern for you. And you can say, oh, I roughly want things to be this close to each other. But that doesn't ever work perfectly. There's always some manual stuff. And again, you do this <laughs> based on every pair that can possibly occur. So it's a lot of permutation. Okay, here is uh, a different word, a different uh, nonsense word, with the same consonants but different vowels. Now this is an E, uh, well, to me it's just an E, um, pronounced. It's a shorty like that, and the word is um, zhezhek. Nonsense? I totally. Okay, good. <laughs> but if I change it to zhezhek, then all of a sudden I have a terrible problem with this very nice flourish that goes up on his handwriting on the, on the more uh, acute A, the A sound as opposed to the S sound. So in this case it actually resulted in my looking at the problem thinking, you know, no matter of left and right is going to solve this problem. So I actually went back to the drawing board. I also noticed that the, the general height of the body of it, the M looking part, was kind of small or short in the original. So I extended that, and I made your flourish a little bit more flourishy. So that works better, you see, with the current pairs, because now the A can kind of jump up over the Q. And again, this is a handwriting font, so I had the liberty of doing that. If this were a different kind of typeface, a more Times Roman looking thing or a helvetica looking thing, then I might have been in a different situation. But again, the, the goal is to make it look as beautiful as possible, but also fit together as, as much as any normal typographic system should or could. So once you go to all this trouble to figure out that everything looks beautiful, and you practice typing and you're content with everything, you have to generate the fonts. And again, now we have uh, Linux, we have Mac, we have uh, you know, Windows, we have TrueType, we have OpenType, there are lots of different variations. So you need to figure out basically what system, you know, who you're going to be sharing with. If you're, if he uses this on Linux, um, I use it on Mac. So I went for something that was uh, an open type slash Windows true type that works well on everything. Um, and again, it's cross-platform Mac, Windows, Unix. But depending on your need, you might have chosen a different format. Open type is the newest. It's the most kind of uh, dynamic standard. Uh, you probably, David, you probably had to use open type to get, no, you didn't? I used true type. Oh, true type. Okay, great. Well, um, so even for something as complex as, as his <coughs> and custom, you, you can get by with true type. In there. So you generate it and then you install it however you would normally install a font on your system. On the Mac, we use a utility called Fontbook. 
and then you test it in a wide variety of applications. So here we are showing it being tested in Keynote. And again, this is just text behaving like any Roman text would behave. And if you have a real font, then you can take any of those fancy display options like flipper or drop or pop or crash or whatever they are, and they'll just work because you have a full function font. The messy part is when you do start testing in real applications, then you find out, oh, this is a problem, or there's a data error, or this pair just will not turn properly, or you run into those kind of things, and you get in this loop here, which you know probably needs another big internal <laughs> loop back again thing. But most of the steps on the right are just really procedural, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of patience. But if you do that, then you will have a tool and a system uh, to use your language in very innovative ways using basically any kind of standard computer design technology, um, if that's important to you. Another benefit of, of doing it with a font creation program is that once you have your font established, uh, Photographer, for example, will build other weights for you. It will build italic versions, it will build bold, you can build the light version by changing what's called uh, the M weight. So the M is uh, a standard for the size, the conceptual size that all the fonts are. Um, I'm not going to get into that level of detail, but basically just by changing a percentage of thickness, if you want to think of it that way, uh, you can get something uh, that is much easier to create that second version, like in a matter of minutes maybe, instead of a matter of days or weeks. Uh, again, you might need to kern, you might need to go back and fix, um, but once you've got a really solid foundation established in a specific typeface, it's relatively easy to create new versions. So uh, here's, we, we are at the end, and I'd like to just suggest for your consideration, out of my experience with, with Tony and with Jim Hawkins, um, I realized for the first time, these were basically the first fonts that, that I've ever made. And I realized that you know, there are basically two big buckets in this. There's the creative artistic side, and some people skew very creative and very artistic, and they're good with a pen and a brush, and they might be good with the pen tool and Adobe Illustrator, for example. But then when it gets to the technical side of worrying about kerning or uh, figuring out why something isn't displaying properly in my word processor, processor and whatnot, it's a much more technical thing. So I, I propose to everybody here that if you're interested in building your own fonts and you're, you skew more to the artistic side, maybe you would want to collaborate with someone who needs some help in making their typeface or their design look really pretty, they might be a more technical person who could help you with actually taking that beautiful artwork and cobbling it into a working font, or an entire family of working fonts, or eight families of working fonts, or whatnot, mm -hmm. um, depending on how crazy you want to go with it. So uh, that's basically all I have. I'm perfectly happy to take questions about either the font stuff or um, the uh, language stuff, if you're interested in Sinanda. Again, it's not going to be spoken in the, in the language, but I did want everything that appears on the screen to be grammatical and, and to resonate a sense of authenticity. So that's why it's not just a bunch of different typefaces, but it's a bunch of different typefaces that are actually saying something, even if you can't read that as an audience member. So thanks so much, and I'm ready for questions as long as we have some time still. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Could you make a font for Anals? For what? Uh, the nonlinear writing system. What, that was out there that uh -huh. I had to look at because I was setting up my computer. Show it to me later, and I'll see. Actually, I don't have. Um, the most advanced skills, I mean really, for font making. But I just had somebody out of the blue from New Jersey email me and say, I want to take one of your very complicated Vulcan squirrely-do systems and I want to build fonts for that. 
And unfortunately, for prepping for this and other reasons, I haven't even had time to collaborate with him yet. But he, he has more of the, the technical skills. So depending on how complex the script is, it may, it may be possible, but I, I would need to look at it. Or David should probably look at it quickly and tell you whether it's possible or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a no. So do you have anything online for my tutorials, especially for stuff where you come up against some of the limitations of fonts are built for English and how to get around those? Do you have any sort of tips and stuff online anywhere? I I've never done a presentation like this before, so no, I don't I don't have anything like that online. But there is a lot of stuff. I mean, the type community um, is gigantic and international. And if you look at kind of typography and font making in general, you you may find that. Do you do you have a specific example of where English mindset is a problem? I'm trying to do something that's sort of compositional where sort of similar to cast then in a way where you have to you know take something and multiple inputs to produce a single glyph. And then that's all vertical and you're just stuck with it being vertical. Uh -huh. Well the vertical stuff there are two ways to approach that. What what I did with the Vulcan stuff that I did that's also vertical is to just do it as a horizontal thing. If you have software that can rotate text and the software rotates it, if you don't, if you have very basic computer skills and only a word processor, then you can just type it all horizontally and then print the page and rotate it. I mean, it's the most kind of fundamental way to think about it. But um, it, it works, actually, uh, especially if your writing direction is compatible with later rotating that page. Um, but it, 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 the vertical stuff also I discovered by people collaborating with me and beta testing my font, that if you have a really new version of Microsoft Word, and you go turn on Mongolian support, then <laughs> it will probably just work. Um, if, your, if your font is properly designed, because traditional Mongolian is written vertically, and I don't know at some point Microsoft put support for that in Word. So I haven't actually tried it yet, I confess. But, um, but I, because I typically use Pages or Illustrator or something that you can easily rotate text in, so I don't go to the trouble to do. I, in fact, I have. Word on Mac, which won't be Mongolian, but, uh, but on Windows, I understand that it does. For the compositional problem, that's more something you could talk to David about, about his, when you saw his, his feature file with all the, the yeah. woes, all, right. all that <coughs> stuff in it, you, you basically have to name each clip, and then you, you call that based on ligatures that you have to find. There's a little bit of coding-like stuff that you have to do. I'm sure David can explain it to you. Um, I noticed that all of the, what you showed us, they were all disconnected letters. But a lot of natural languages, like Arabic, mm -hmm. uh, the script is cursive, it's all connected, and the shape of the letter is context dependent. It depends mm -hmm. on the letter that you before and after. Mm -hmm. And then there's things like ligatures and how it all connects. Okay. And I don't want you to get into a really technical explanation because I won't understand. <laughs> but but the stuff that you were talking about, can you use these these programs to do stuff like that? Yes, yes you can. Um, the, the, the thing that's a little bit different about that is that you have to have an encoding, that is a, a, a relationship between the typing and the software that recognizes that, oh, when a B is in initial position it looks like this, when it's between vowels it looks like that. If you have a writing system that a B might combine with a consonant, it might change in a different shape. But the thing that I would recommend for you in that case is that you find, if you're on Windows, there's um, FontForge, I think, which is, there's public domain software, actually open source stuff that's also free on Windows. So um, you could take an Arabic font, for example, and just open it and, and see how all the pieces fit together. And I would kind of reverse engineer maybe an idea for the way your script would work by kind of picking Arabic apart. But by just looking at that table, when you saw the table with all the glyphs in it of all of Tony's letters, I would go open an Arabic font and look at it. And, and basically they'll, be, they'll occur um, in a logical order and relationship. But again, you would need a you would need, depending on how complex your system is, 
a, a way, possibly on top of what I've talked to you about today, you might need a keyboard layout, which is an additional coding effort that, again, you might find a technical person who could do that for you very easily if, if that's not the kind of thing that you could do yourself. I, I think it's really important now in the age of community and online stuff to, sh you know, to like share and everybody do what they're good at. And so you might find somebody who would not design beautiful looking pieces and parts of that font, but writing a keyboard layout for you would be very little effort for them. Uh, just, just to answer that really quickly, Arabic changes based on the context. It's context-dependent context dependent ligature, right. but actually forms don't connect in the font. They don't. They look like it. They do, but they don't. They're just sitting. They're just we're actually just sitting there, you know, like. And top of the yeah, yeah, or then maybe they're overlapping a tiny, tiny bit, but they don't. They're not. Um, if you if you type bat, you know that's probably that's bat. It's just different a b and a different a and a t. I, again, I'm not talking about Arabic specifically because it doesn't track all the vowels. But anyway, it's right. And even in even in the typeface, the Sinyanda stuff that I've been showing you, all the vowels are below the consonants. So what they're doing is actually just sitting underneath the consonants. They're separate glyphs. All of the vowels are just. Okay. Separate, but instead of like Arabic being side by side, they just um, go under the baseline and they're all positioned to the left of the point of origin, so they all end up being underneath the consonants. Okay. So you have consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel. Okay. Right. I have a, a script for one of my languages, Rothal, that was inspired by. Hindi, Thai, and Arabic. Uh -huh. So it writes right to left mm -hmm. with a binding headline, mm -hmm. and the vowels are written. The the characters are all consonants, but the vowels are written above the binding headline or below the consonant. Mm -hmm. How much fuss would something like that be to put in? If if it's like Thai in the sense that you have m multiple things that have to occur on top of each other. And depending on whether or not both items occur, one of the other items moves up and down. That turns into what's called a complex script, and that requires more coding. Um, it's, it's more trouble. But if you basically have three regions where there's like diacritics up here and core letters in the middle and diacritics or vowels down underneath, then you can get by with giving certain of the vowels or the diacritics. I, I don't know how your system works, but by giving them a negative, like a zero space, or having them having them originate to the left of the point of origin, then they will they will come over or above the the consonant. I assume it, if it's like an Avogadro like Thai, for example, the consonant is in the middle. Right. So you you may be in luck, but if you have something like Thai, where you have um, aha I got, and then you have a tone mark above that. Um, then you know you 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 have to tell it that if the vowel is missing, move the tone mark down, and that's a more complex thing that you have to do. That requires coding again to make it all behave properly. Are, are you aware of any font making software that's open source that runs on Linux? Um, not off the top of my. I don't use Linux, but Tony Tony loves Linux, so he might know what to do. Yes, Fontforge. Fontforge is actually um, originated originated on Linux. That makes sense. And and in fact, I think to run it on Windows, you have to use um, Sigwin or one of the, the Unix emulator setups on Windows. Fontforge. So Fontforge. Yeah. Um, and just, just Google it. It's it's a work, its own project. It's a fairly active open source project. Um, I don't think it's as powerful by any means as photographer, but it's better than a lot of the low end, um, you know, one to two hundred dollar uh, creation programs. Oh, it's quite powerful, and it supports complex scripts. But uh, you have to be a little bit more sophisticated in your ability to interact with it yeah. in <coughs> terms of coding. Yeah, and just a just point, steep learning curve. <coughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's not for the faint of heart, but um, but I don't use it. I I have a faint heart. I don't. Use it. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Yeah. 
Um, George on RC asks, uh, how do you deal with scripts that would need to be flexible ordering, such as a script with both vertical and horizontal modes or Boustrophodon scripts? Should you create separate fonts for each order or what? You know, I don't know exactly how to answer that. That's kind of be beyond my um, beyond my understanding. I mean, I think honestly, to get stuff to go in both directions, you, you're dealing with something at the application level. I mean, you could fake it, but depending on, um, you know, for example, if it were a relatively simple thing and it needed to rotate or flip, you could put everything in lowercase or everything in uppercase, or using this system that David used for cast, then you could. Name it. To actually get it to input live as you're typing and behave on screen would be a lot of work. I mean, and again, that's more the application, that's the display application. <coughs> um, some art applications, you know, it, it would be relatively easy in Adobe Illustrator, for example, to rotate stuff and get the right outcome, and having a font as a base would probably definitely be easier than just having a bunch of artwork that you have to manually drag over and put in place yourself. But um, yeah, the kind of point of the kind of you know flow of text thing is the bigger problem there because most most software systems today assume just one like it's either right to left or left to right. Well, a, a similar is Japanese, right? Which can be uh, left to right or uh, up to down. But not not in I mean not in the same paragraph, for example. So I don't know how complicated that he's talking about. Japanese, yeah, is typical Japanese word processing software assumes, at least for the block of text, that it's all running in one direction. So it either runs right to left, top to bottom, or normally, normally like it does in English, left to right, top to bottom. It doesn't, I mean, you could get a layout in a magazine that has both, but your layout software has discrete blocks of text, and they each have an orientation on multiple things. Oh. <laughs> okay, if FontForge is free but has a steep learning curve and Fontographer is probably out of my budget but easier to use, is there some happy medium that's fairly cheap and yet easy to use? Um, David mentioned what you want to talk about. You probably know the type tool there. Uh, oh, oh well, Type Tool Type Tool is fairly cheap. It's a hundred bucks, and but it, it does have a bit of a learning curve, and it doesn't have all the features of something like a Font Lab Studio. But cheaper is uh, FontStruct, which is free, very low learning curve, uh, but it's nowhere near as powerful. And I somebody was mentioning on IRC that they didn't have that they were unsatisfied with the results, but I've heard a lot of people that said they were. I would say the first place to go would be FontStruct. And if you come across something that you can't do and don't want to do, that's the time to research something else. That's sounds like a good answer. place to start. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say I use Fontscript. And you like it? Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's very basic, but it's 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 work. We can do some amazing things with it. All right. There you go. Positive feedback on Fontscript. I just wanted to say I've done all my Fontscript stuff, and it has its limitations, and it's completely different from using um, one that does the, the, the line um, directly. But um, it's, um, it's probably the quickest way if you don't want to spend money. It works well with rel relatively straight, straight, straight lines. lines, yeah. yeah. So um, you're, you're going to need it. Hundred dollar to hundred dollar ish kind of thing, or the learning curve of Font Forge. If you want to get very beautiful, like Bezier design curvatures and things like that, the less expensive uh, software. And I, I, I Font Maker too, right on the iPad, um, will allow you to basically use your finger or a stylus and and draw. But if you need something that looks like an absolutely perfect curve, if you're creating some very ornate um, script that would be the equivalent of something used on a wedding invitation, for example, those tools are probably not going to support that level of design. So, um, but I, I think it's a great idea to learn, to learn the basic concepts, the kinds of things that we saw today, 
in a very inexpensive piece of software like that. And then if you're still motivated, after you've endured burning, for example, if you're still motivated, <laughs> um, then you could you know, move the graphic skills up and move up the, the kind of the level of commitment in terms of the money as well. Or, or find somebody to collaborate with. To if you don't if you're willing to do that collaborate not do it yourself. Um, so my first comment was going to be on the iPhone Maker app, which it is like all zero learning curve. All my students figured out how to use it relatively quickly, and um, in Word you can still bold and italicize <coughs> your font, so it still does like some of those features that normal fonts can do, and it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. But then my actual question for you is um, do you suggest any resources for those of us who would love to get better in typography um, and actually be able to design these fonts and the programs and the fancier ones? Are there any, is there like a Bible of typography that you would suggest for us to go get it? Or is this better hands-on learning with somebody who knows what they're doing to figure out these features? Um, I, I don't I don't own any book right now that I that I can send you to as kind of the Bible of, of font design. I think that they're kind of two different things. First of all, there's the aesthetic tradition, the history to beautiful type design, and that's very much um, you know there are probably a hundred books out there that you can find on the history of it, all the way from lead type through to the modern things that can be done. And then there's the, then there's the separate kind of technical problem. So, and I found for me personally that with the technical problem, the, the best thing I found was uh, a guy who put together his own kind of process, in, similar to my rough sketch today, but in a 600 page PDF of like how he actually built fonts. And he used a combination of fontographer and illustrator and um, your tool, what is it, David? Um, Font Lab Studio. Yeah, Font Lab Studio. So he, he actually kind of put that together, and it was very kind of, you know, tips and tricks and, you know, dirty solutions and all that kind of stuff. And I that resonated more with me than kind of the theory of the actual process of all the kerning and everything else. But I think if you just search online, and Typophile is a fantastic site. There are all kinds of sites. Um, that are dedicated to kind of the beauty and the tradition of typography. And I think you can learn a lot by reading that, even if it's not focused specifically on something that's not normal. Well, hang on, what, what's the one that you mentioned? This this 600 page PDF of the guy, like what's the name of the guy and how do we get it? Um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go look and try to find it and provide it. I don't remember off the top of my head. It's one of the books that is sold by um, Font Lab, and it's one of their Users, but again, I think it's. If I remember correctly, it's you know it's a PDF that you purchase as a, a download, and it, it. I don't remember the price, but it's very reasonable. I think it was under twenty dollars, and it, it basically you know he just steps you through his process, but with a thousand screenshots instead of fourteen, you know, and and taught and a lot of discussion about things that are likely to go wrong, and by all means don't do this, and you know that kind of thing. I found that quite helpful. And I actually read that before I purchased one however, when Jim and Tony and I were talking about what tool to use and how much to invest and all that. So I, I is it that gave me confidence to think that oh I can actually use this and learn to use it and that it was worth spending I think roughly three hundred dollars at the time on other work which it is so Leslie Kabar uh, learned from the Thank you. Quick question. How much is the Okay, and then the iPhone maker was six ninety nine. Plus tax. Yeah, but I mean, you can't. I, I don't have an iPad actually, or, or uh, I guess that works on Android too. I'm not sure about that. But uh, I may be uh, okay. Maybe only an iPad. But I don't have an iPad, so I haven't actually used it. But based on what I have seen, for the basic idea of understanding mappings, it supports Unicode. They have support in there for Thai and Japanese already. The I think the makers of that app are not. They're not from North America. Um, if I'm not mistaken. So they already have an international non Roman mindset going on. So I think that, you know, $7, that's not a bad investment to touch base with font making. Okay, so we have a, a comment here. I think a question there. And be really quick. Yeah, real quick. Um, in answer to your question, um, there's a terrific book, one of my favorites, called The Elements in Typographic Style. You know what? Yeah. Right? So I bet everybody here would actually probably appreciate it on one level or another. It's really beautiful.
Um, uh, actually, a uh, question and comment. Um, were, is the book that you were thinking of, Learn Font Lab Fast by Leslie Carbarga? Uh, could be. That again, it was a couple of years ago, so I don't, I don't remember. What, what's the price on it? For uh, it's uh, 26 bucks on Amazon. Mm, I don't know. I, I'll, have, I'll go look. That, okay. will, that covers not what you mean. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, something that inspired me, I can't speak to font making because my uh, orthography is unfontable, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, reading Edward Tufte was uh, pretty significantly inspirational. For, so for instance, uh, visual display of quantitative information, uh, envisioning information, etc. The whole suite of books is excellent yeah. and highly recommended.